So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this um, uh, panel discussion, which is a pre-event that the Godan Art Center is holding within the context of the nine, the ninth AfriCities Summit. Uh, the AfriCities is basically a triennial event. It's held every three years in one of the five regions of Africa. It's organized by uh, an organization, an African organization called the United Cities and Local Governments of Africa. And its aim really is to strengthen the role of local and regional governments in the development of the continent and to help build the integration and unity of Africa. And so this year, the summit of course is happening in Kisumu, it's happening in Kenya, which is very exciting for us. And the theme is the role of intermediary cities of Africa in the implementation of Agenda 2030 of the United Nations and the African Union's Agenda 2063. Now intermediary cities, of course, are those cities that are not the capital. I think for those of us who follow um, cities and the conversations and the discourses that are happening on cities, we may notice that often it's the capital cities that are being discussed, but this particular AfriCities forum is focusing on the intermediary cities and hence the, the, the reason why it is being hosted in a city that is not the capital city, which is Kisumu. Now, it is our view, I think, as the go down that convening such as the AfriCity Summit are actually excellent spaces for cultural practitioners to make contribution to and also to benefit from. Um, for those who know the Godown's work, we are very much interested in the role of culture in uh, sustainable urban development, the role of culture in cities. And so this um, discourse and opportunity sits very much within, within our vision and our mission. Um, in the panel today, we have, I think, four um, very interesting speakers who engage with this question of culture and cities in, in, in different ways. Um, so we will have uh, a participant, uh, Babushe, who is also known as Maina Gishohi formerly. Uh, he's from Nakuru, and he's going to be talking about uh, Nakuru as a UNESCO creative city. This is important, um, the idea of creative cities, because already it begins to imply that there's a role for, for cultural practitioners, for artists and creatives within it. And so we'll be engaging with Babushe on that particular uh, question of Nakuru and its status, its current status as a creative city. We also have uh, Maggie Otieno, who is a sculptor and a public art installation artist and also an entrepreneur, creative entrepreneur. And we will engage on the question of public art, because again, when you look at cities, when you look at public spaces, um, whether they're buildings or whether they're open spaces, uh, public art has a very important role um, that, that it can play there. But I think also as we discuss cities, um, the next panelist who will be Flora Muterio Kuku, will be looking together at this question of identity, heritage and cities. Uh, many of our cities on the African continent, because of colonialism, uh, are spaces that started because of uh, colonial activity and colonial development. Um, but then, of course, we are now independent nations, and there is there are issues and questions that come with this migration into the cities, whether people feel that they belong into the city or not, uh, and 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 so on. And how are our contemporary planners planning for for independent Africans in their cities? And then finally, um, the fourth panelist is George Arabu. Uh, George is um, an architect. Uh, he's uh, the, chair, uh, uh, the chairperson of uh, uh, the architects chapter um, with the Architectural Association of Kenya. And we will engage him on the question of approaches to professional practice, how these might be changing, especially in the light of this theme that I think has, has caught the imagination of the whole world, which is um, sustainability, sustain, sustainable development goals, sustainable cities, and so on. How does this affect practice and how does a practitioner, an architect or a planner begin to embed or not embed um, some of this thinking within their practice? Okay, so thank you very much to all of the panelists for joining and attending. And also thank you very much for those who have joined the room. After they've made their presentations, we shall um, open the floor for your questions to them. Um, but I think as has been indicated, as you're listening, you can uh, put questions in the chat and uh, we shall be picking those up. So I think we'll open with, um, with um, engaging uh, Babushe 
So Babouchet, a thespian, um, but also uh, uh, basically the contact, the creative contact for UNESCO Creative Cities. Um, he is a vice chair of the Nakuru City Players uh, and somebody who is very much engaged and involved in the creative life in Nakuru. So Babouchet, karibu sana. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joy. Excellent. So I yeah. should. So I guess the first question that I that you know that I'll put to you is to ask you to to just give us a sense of of what Nakuru City is like in relation to the creative economy and creative activities. What what makes Nakuru tick? What kinds of creative activities can one find when we visit your city? Well, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Nakuru is just. Uh, at this moment is really transforming and it's just uh, really realizing itself the, ab about what creativity and culture can do to, to the economy. Uh, we have uh, the creatives now realizing uh, the use of the spaces and realizing that uh, uh, Nakuru is one of, one of the wonderful spaces that we have. And there are so many uh, interesting spaces around that needs to be uh, transformed and or even uh, re regenerated or rejuvenated uh, to engage the communities in, in, in culture. Uh, just recently, be, be, uh, just recently, we were designated to uh, UNESCO Creative City in the, in the sector of uh, crafts and folk arts. And uh, when you look at the history and the, uh, the, the general uh, geography of Nakuru, it's that uh, Nakuru is it's more created from uh, the, the colonial aspect. There's, there's been a lot of colonial activity there before that has been able uh, to, to create this industry. And we are picking it up from that gap that was there before. You know, there's a time that uh, only, that only, only, uh, the white people are allowed to enjoy the arts uh, from their from the colonial masses. Africans were not enjoy enjoying the arts, and you could look at even from the history of the Nakuru Players Theatre, uh, the way it was designed. That time, the Africans were not allowed uh, even to get to town. So, right now that the Africans, we as the Africans are there, we are we are reimagining the space. We are, we are imagining not only the Nakuru Player Theater, but all the other spaces that we have in town that uh, we, we can engage in, in uh, artistic activities. Wonderful. So, so the designation for Nakuru is yes. basically a creative city in crafts and folk arts. Maybe yes. you can just say a little bit about those two discipline areas and how that is manifesting in Nakuru City and the kinds yes. of opportunity that these are creating in terms of um, revenue um, and livelihood? Yes, when we look at the, uh, the issue of uh, crafts and folk arts, especially folk arts, there's a lot of uh, intangible cultural heritage. There's a lot of uh, stories around uh, the many spaces that we have. There's a lot of stories about the activities that were all ongoing from the, the prehistoric man. There's a lot of evidence again about uh, the, the prehistoric man, and uh, we, we can see there, we find uh, uh, discoveries of uh, early tools that the, 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 uh, the, the early man used. Uh, that is evidence in the uh, Kariandusi Museum. It has history up to about 12 million years. And then we have other, 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 other even we have people with personal museums who have collected information that uh, dates back to about uh, about uh, 3,000 years ago. And then we have the Hyrax Hill as well, uh, uh, which is part of uh, where there's a collection of uh, a prehistoric, uh, prehistoric man. So uh, based on that, looking at things from, from that area, uh, we, we, are, we are able to say, we are able to, we are able to be qualified as a, as a, a city of crafts and, 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 and forecasts. Mm. No, wonderful. Yes. So maybe, but maybe you can say a little bit, um, um, Babushi, about um, the, the the process of, of of achieving this designation. Um, how, oh. did Nakuru, <laughs> how did Nakuru artists advocate for this? What was the process? What was the genesis? 
and the journey. Well, yeah, that's, that, that, that had been a journey that we started four years ago. It, it was a, a, a very grueling task for the application, especially for the application. And even there was a, the, the, the biggest challenge then was to, to convince the, the county government that we need to take that direction to, to join the, the UCCN. So it was a little bit of a challenge even to convince a lot of people about the, the opportunities and the directions that the UCCN is taking. Uh, that grueling process, uh, four years after we started the conversation, uh, it got to a point that uh, the, the county government felt like, nah, I, th I think they need to look at what this uh, UCCN is talking about. So we did some trainings, about 10 of them, and uh, we even had sessions with the, with the UNESCO, and uh, we were able uh, to fill up the form. It took us about six months, uh, sleepless nights, trying to fill up. You know, the questions were like, you fill up one question, we go to question three, you, you don't know, you, you are lost. You don't know what you are answering in question one. You have to get back, do a lot of reviews. They, they all, it, then it included a lot of research. We had a team, uh, a, a team uh, we, which we brought together. And uh, yes, it was, it was quite grueling. In fact, when we qualified the, the first beat, when we qualified the technical part, I was also sure that we were, we were going to qualify and even get designated. But uh, I think we were able to convince uh, the, the, uh, in, in the questions we answered and about the opportunities that are there and the directions that we, we are intending to take as a, a UCCN member. Mm -hmm. No, so basically what you're saying there, um, Babushe, is that the impetus really for pushing um, for yes. this um, uh, designation came from the artist community and that yes. there was a good degree of, of um, persuading of advocating mm -hmm. with the policymakers, with the county itself, to, to understand and see the value of, of this designation. So now that Nas N Nakuru is, has joined this network of um, creative cities, the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, mm -hmm. what value do you think this is already bringing to the creative sector in Nakuru? Or if not yet, what is potentially the value that this will bring to the creative sector in Nakuru? Uh, well, uh, it, it has brought quite a lot of value to Nakuru. One it's, is that it has, uh, it has increased in the level of branding. Nakuru now is a, is a city that can, can be very much proud of, uh, for having joined the network. Uh, and, and we are looking at those opportunities that are within the network as we do, uh, as we follow up to and engage with the objectives of the network. We are seeing uh, mostly we need to do a lot of networking with other organizations. It, it, it has brought uh, the, the sense that uh, we need to really work with the vulnerable. Now we are, we, we are working mostly with the, community, the vulnerable communities within town. And uh, there's a lot of content that we, we have identified within that. And then we're looking at the opportunities that now are, are, are opening up for us that we, we can be able to start engaging and in the network with the, uh, with the other cities within the network. And uh, the, the, it, it has given us a little bit of value that uh, we feel like uh, we, we, are, we are leading the arts and culture uh, in, in, in the country or in the region, if you like it. Uh, so there's, there's quite a lot of value that we are seeing. Now we are also engaging ourselves in uh, community tourism, something that uh, we, we had never thought that uh, would, be, would, would be workable. And we are seeing, we are, we are bringing even the government in this conversation about uh, community tourism and seeing how the people in the community can start taking advantage, can start using culture as a... As, as an economic tool as well. Mm. No, wonderful. So in a sense, you're saying that, um, that, that of course, the, the mandate that you then get as a, a member of the network um, yes. is presents a kind of a roadmap for the creative sector within Nakuru to begin to organize its activities at a sector level, which is, which is interesting. So as you're saying, some of those things is how do, you, how do you bring in, how do you become inclusive and bring in those who are marginalized? But also, as you're saying, how do you 
exercise opportunities or open up opportunities for things like community tourism and so on. But in this yeah. process, I guess my question is, and this is probably some of the last questions that I'll ask you before I move on to another panelist, is that you indicated that, of course, the impetus came from the artist at the start. And yes. now Nakuru has won this designation. What is the relationship of, of working with, with um, the city of Nakuru, Nakuru City's administration, to now walk through this roadmap and this opportunity that the designation brings to, to, to yourselves? Are there challenges? Are there successes? Yeah, there, there are quite of challenges. There are quite a lot of challenges, but uh, we, are, we are really working through through them. Like, like today, we've just been having a sensitization meeting with the UNESCO, with the, uh, the county government and the stakeholders. So we, we are coming to one table to start and looking at, uh, what, because we designed a roadmap for Nakuru, we a four-year roadmap. So we, we are looking at what, what are the, uh, these opportunities that we can share with the stakeholders? How do we, how we, do we engage the people of Nakuru to be part of this process? And then we are looking at what, what are the low-lying fruits that we can uh, quickly be able to take advantage of and, and see how we can engage uh, the, 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 the communities in this. Uh, for example, uh, another quick example that I'll give is that we were able to celebrate the World uh, UNESCO World Arts Day. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we took this event uh, right into the community, uh, a place that uh, nobody expected that we uh, that uh, an activity would, uh, would ever happen there, uh, and uh, from the reception of the community itself, the, for us to identify that space as a, as an economic space that the com community can reimagine that space and uh, and start engaging in a, in, in an enterprise a, a, a community tourism enterprise, uh, it has even attracted the attention of. Uh, the government itself, they are like, wow, this is, this is quite interesting. And then uh, we've also been able to attract the Kenya Wildlife Services who, who feel like, uh, because the part of the lake had closed down, the part of the lake next to the community because of the water increase. Now they feel like this aspect of uh, having uh, that, uh, that in engagement with the community as, as, a, a, as a new economic enterprise is, uh, is, is something quite worthwhile. Mm. No, yes. wonderful. No, thank you so much, Babushu. I think that we, we are all looking at Nakuru. I mean, for those of us who are sitting in, in, in other cities and, 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 yes. and towns, um, to yeah. try and learn from your creative sector but even without the designation, how mm -hmm. to also begin to learn how a, a community within a city, a creative community within yeah. a city, can can create a roadmap yeah. that is um, that, that 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 you know that that contributes to the city's economy, that lifts the livelihoods of of, of um, its residents, um, but mm -hmm. also importantly begins to make a, a connection between the county administration or the city administration and the creative sector itself. Yeah, no, so thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for sharing that. And again, um, to the participants, um, if there are questions or things, uh, comments that you have that are coming up, just put them in the chat and we'll be getting back to, to Babushe again. Okay, now I'd like to move okay. on to um, Maggie, Maggie Otieno. So Maggie, as we mentioned, is a sculptor. Uh, she's um, also a public um, art installation uh, artist. Uh, and she's also a creative entrepreneur. Um, Maggie, there seems to be clearly in, in, at least in Nairobi and I'm sure in, um, in uh, Nakuru and certainly in Kisumu as well, a recognition that public art expressions, you know, need to be created and, 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 and placed in public spaces or, or, or buildings, you know, the public areas of buildings, the lobbies, placed in parks, placed in plazas and so on. And, and I think that certainly in Nairobi, there have been more public art commissions that we're seeing coming up. And also seeing then as a result that artists, uh, some artists are becoming proficient in this area and very keen in this area. And maybe we can start by asking you to just share with us um, some of the public art that you have undertaken um, in, in, your, in your career. Uh, thank you so much, Joy. Uh, thank you, Babushe. It was good seeing you. You look like a heritage site. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. 
Oh my gosh, nice to see you, Babushe. Nice to see you as well. <laughs> um, well, um, as Joy has mentioned, my name is uh, Maggie Otieno. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, very clearly. Okay, um, I've been practicing uh, sculptures for the past 26 years. And uh, it has been a very exciting journey, sometimes very rough journey. And uh, for me, uh, the most exciting part of my work is actually to show my work in public spaces. Because uh, most of the time when we do small pieces for clients in their homes, they're the ones who enjoy with their family and relatives. But when you put your work there in the public space, um, there's something that you're saying. There are people you are saying that to, and these are multitudes. And I think for any artist, it's such a joy when uh, multitudes can actually just come and uh, see your work and interact with it. So um, I've done a couple of public arts. Uh, there's a Siokimao railway station. Uh, I did a sculpture of the prophetess Siokimao, and uh, she's pointing up at, a, at the ceiling. And uh, she's seeing this uh, train that is coming uh, down towards her. And uh, the story behind that is uh, Siokimao was a prophetess in the area and uh, she prophesied about the coming of the, of the white uh, man. And uh, she said that uh, she saw a, a, an iron snake coming down from the sky with people that looked white and they spoke like birds. So uh, what the client wanted to do was uh, bring that story up so that those people who are coming to the railway station can actually know the true story of the Siokimao area. And for me, it was so interesting because there are so many people who never knew that Siokimao was actually a person mm. and that uh, she actually prophesied something that came to pass. And uh, that, that story about Siokimao just brought like a fresh lease of uh, conversations to the people who are uh, in that uh, using the space. I've also done uh, some sculptures at uh, Imaradaima radio station. It's a huge mural that is celebrating uh, the Kenyan athletes. Uh, the same radio station in Imaradaima, <clears throat> just outside the parking lot, there's a sculpture of, uh, <clears throat> of two runners running on the railway track. I've also done uh, sculptures at um, Makadara railway station. And this railway station was dedicated to the Tomboya and the Labour Union because the just, uh, I think, uh, maybe 500 meters away from the station, there was the Tomboya Hall, which unfortunately uh, is not actively being used as it used to be. Um, and then I've also done uh, some sculptures at uh, Garden City, uh, just at the entrance. There are two entrances. So when you get through the entrance of uh, East African breweries, you see some metal, huge metal sculptures. I call them uh, gatekeepers. Uh, those are made out of uh, mild steel. Uh, I've also done a collaborative uh, public art at uh, Kenyatta Hospital. So those are some of the places where I've done public art. No, oh, wonderful. And I think in describing them, at least the ones that you've engaged with, uh, Maggie, it seems that there are sort of two distinct kinds so far in, in your career. Ones that are sitting in, in um, spaces that are, are, are really meeting places because they're transport hubs in a sense, um, mm -hmm. where a very diverse kind of public um, engages, but they're located in a particular place within the city. And, and that the Siokima one, for example, gives an opportunity to underscore the history of that naming so that you can see that the role of public art in that particular instance was mm -hmm. to, to really flesh out and bring out um, the history of the name of the place. And as you've indicated, some people didn't even know that Siokimao was a person, but mm -hmm. now we begin, to, we begin to draw out our heritage and our histories um, through the work that you have placed in, 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 some of these, in some of these spaces. So I think that this, I mean, the public realm, of course, as we know is all sorts of people are there. Um, it's a place where we meet, it's a place where we interact, it's a place where we observe, we look, we see, we are seen. Um, and it's a place where, of course, the public artist is placed. In your view, why do you think public art is, is, is important? Why do you think it should be encouraged? Uh, I think the most important thing about uh, public art is that uh, it gives um, spaces identities. Because uh, in this city, wh wh wherever you go, there's always a story about something. Whether it's uh, Ronald Gala Street, whether it is uh, 
Kenyatta Avenue, whether it is Tomboya. There's just a story about something that happened in this uh, location. And there are people who have history that we don't know unless somebody comes and tells us this actually happened here. And uh, I feel that uh, it is so important for artists and creative people together with urban planners to start uh, generating, <coughs> generating uh, visuals through these places. And um, I, I feel that um, when it comes to public spaces, we have actually not done justice mm. to our spaces because these are canvases of conversations that are not hard, but when an artist, when you tell an artist, this actually happened here. You're actually educating also the, the larger uh, public. And I've, uh, and I've said, as I've said, it's, uh, it's places uh, for identity and it's places for conversations as well. Because uh, the places where I have done um, artworks, uh, whether they're, they're clear stories like uh, the Sukimau or the Tomboya, mm -hmm. like for example, like the garden, uh, the garden city, those are abstract uh, pieces. But you'll find that there are people, sometimes when I go there, I find people kneeling there and taking photographs. And there are some who are just looking at the, at the pieces. And sometimes you wonder, what, what are they talking about? What are the kind of conversations that are going there? And I feel like the city, cities really need spaces like that. You don't have to understand um, a public art to enjoy it. It can be just this place where you just feel like you want your peace. It can be just this place where you want to go and maybe silently or unconsciously vent. And I, I feel that uh, those spaces are just looking for us as artists to come and do something about them. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And are there, in your experience, have you heard anybody make a comment um, around the public art that you, you've created and what, what sort of comments do you hear them making? So apart from observing them, taking selfies and enjoying sitting next to, have you heard anybody say something or, or react yes. to something? Especially like when I go, when I'm doing installations, there are people who get very curious and come and uh, just ask me, what is this? Like, I remember when I was doing the Garden City uh, sculptures, you know, the, the workers around that place and the people who I found making selfies there, they kept on looking because what I do, I work a lot with, um, with the car parts and some of them will ask me, <laughs> like, uh, no, it's not supposed, because it's, it's from an engine. So they feel like, was it supposed to be moving and now it's not moving? And then they ask me, what is it? So when I'm trying to tell them, okay, this is a person, there's a nose here. They're like, miss <laughs> yoni yokito. So there's some people who don't understand and they wonder why do we have something that we don't understand in this space? But then there are some people who would come and uh, I, I feel like because they are um, accustomed to art and maybe they have seen other uh, artworks in public spaces, they would just come and say such lovely things like, oh, this is so creative, this is so beautiful. How did you come up with these concepts? But uh, for so many Kenyans, locals, they, they don't understand and they feel that we should do more of things that resonate with how they feel. <laughs> so there are always those kinds, two, two kinds of uh, people. <laughs> and indeed, I think in your work, you've sort of done both. So, you know, for some, you've, you've, you've really underscored the, and brought out the story of, of history and heritage um, mm. and educated people in the process. And of course, the artist is also free to, to express in ways that are abstract and sometimes challenging for us to understand, but still beautiful and intriguing nevertheless. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. Thank you very much. So now we move on to um, uh, Flora Mutere Okuku. So Flora is actually a lecturer at the Technical University of Kenya in the Design and Creative uh, Media Department, um, but also somebody who is very much interested in, in um, the cities uh, and, and the whole question of, of, um, of city making and, and place making. So Flora, I think that um, the questions and exploration that I'd like to sort of do with you is, um, is to just look at this idea of the built urban heritage that we find in the cities that probably came about 
through colonialism. And specifically, if you're looking at Nairobi, of course, if you're looking at um, Nakuru, as, as Babushir has indicated, uh, if you're looking at Kisumu, all with a very strong colonial influence um, that has determined perhaps the pattern of the way the city is laid out. Um, some of the buildings that we recognize that define uh, those, those cities, again, are things that have come from the colonial period. But of course, today we have adapted them, we are using them um, perhaps differently from what they were then. And for me, this, this, this whole idea of adaptation and increasing urbanization um, is, is an interesting question. And so I think I'd like to just ask you to reflect a little bit on, on this question of becoming more urban citizens as Kenyans. In fact, they say that the world is going to become more urban 50% by about 2050. How do you think what is your reflection on how artists, how architects, how planners can really be intentional around the monuments, the buildings and the cities that we are creating that can reflect both present um, identities, but also perhaps speak to lost heritage and also speak to adapted heritage? What is your reflection in this, in this space? Oh, thank you, everyone. Uh, to, to Babushe and Maggie, thank you. Your points are, are really valuable to me. Um, so Joy, your question is brilliant. I just want to start from the place of, you know, the role of those practitioners. I look at them as oracles mm -hmm. or mediators, you know, that uh, Maggie and Babushe do the, just the valuable work of translating. Uh, along a continuum of the past, the present, and possibly into the future. So Maggie is, is doing the work of uh, Sio Kimau. So she's telling that story, the myth, the legend, and passing on that heritage onto people in the present. And they ask questions, they reflect, their identities become grounded, um, become formed, become solidified, become baked. Um, so when you reflect on what's going on here in Nairobi, where Technical University is located, it's so interesting to me that the same kind of challenges, thoughts, imaginaries are going on in other post-colonial spaces where the artists, the architects are asking of themselves, what is our role, you know, and taking it on very seriously. And it's a, it's a role of leadership. Because where we are currently, the current epoch right now, especially for the post-colonial, is the decolonial, where we're aiming to, to, to make our stamp, our identity, our mark, I was here. And to carry on the contested heritage of the colonialist is something that we are grappling with. That's the challenge, you know? Yes, I recognize that this is coming from another period, um, the imperialists came and put their stamp. Do I need to continue with that kind of um, look and feel of my space, of my landscape, when it doesn't truly reflect who I am, right? So when an artist or a sculptor like Maggie comes along and puts the story there of, of relating to our prophets, and, and doing the work of, you know, translating that into a sculpture, that's, that's invaluable, that's, that's really important work. So when I reflect, I think the role of those, um, uh, what are they called, professionals, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard, because if you think about contested heritage, what they put on the ground in the next generation people may turn around and say, but what is this? It doesn't reflect us, you know? That's why I mentioned a continuum, a continuum. Mm -hmm. and so I'm thinking that architects, artists, um, planners, they should have courage because they're leaders. They have the awesome job of defining and visualizing that identity and creating belonging for the citizens of, of that space. Uh, they should always be thinking of context, you know? And th 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 that courage, if they think of the context, I don't think anyone would blame them. I'm, I'm just thinking right now what's going on, especially during the Black Lives Matter movement, when people took out their anger and frustration about the inequalities that exist on societies 
on a sculpture, I'm thinking of Bristol, mm. the Colston sculpture was dragged and thrown into the, the river, you know, a court case and so on and all those things. So, so it will take courage to then translate what you think you hear from, from the community or from the social practices that you want to visualize, to put it there. And then hopefully the next generation will take on that legacy and run with it. And even, you know, feel that you've passed on something to them, um, identity and belonging of the space. So, you know, th then the whole aspect of the social aspect of what um, these practitioners do, it's also really important to be participant and yet to be the ones who have the awesome responsibility of, of secreting that knowledge in a very concretized form out there in the public. So it takes courage. And then also knowing that you're, you're, you're part of a process and, and you're doing even, it's, it's an almost a spiritual activity that you're doing, right? So um, those are my reflections on that. And, and, and you know, I look to these people and I, I, I teach, so we do a lot of theory. So when you ask me to reflect, these are the thoughts that are going on in the university that were in a decolonial period. So how do we just turn around that narrative that wasn't ours? And how do we make a mark that is ours saying that we're here, we're present, see and hear us, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, wonderful. Thank you for that reflection. And in fact, I think that um, this idea of, of um, being part of a process, of being part of a continuum, is really the history of all cities, you know. I think I think that it, it, it you know, as it, in, at a present time, you very much feel that um, that that the city should perhaps reflect or, or respond to to certain needs and wishes that you want. Uh, but then, of course, the space that you're sitting in was occupied by others who also had needs and wants and shaped it. And so, this idea that 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 cities are really dynamic entities that we keep shaping and changing. Um, is, is just a reality and that we're sitting on layers of those of those, and those shapings. But I think that talking about the decolonial then um, uh, flow is, is it's, I think it's an interesting one. So, so while we might pull down the, the you know, the, the statuary as, as, as we're seeing in the West around colonial figures who are sitting in spaces that we are sort of thinking is now not appropriate, um, how can we, how can we also appropriately give attention to endogenous heritage? to the heritages of the stories and the histories of ourselves, uh, knowing that our young people and the cities are populated by young people who are global now, they're looking at many different things and they want those many different things to also be part of their, their identity in a sense. So how do we, how do you think uh, an artist or a planner or an architect might begin to give attention to this question of, of what we have, what we bring into this conversation in a space that is contemporary and has access to the global. And, mm -hmm. and I guess and that I'll ask the second part of that is are there principles perhaps that can be upheld in this regard, even if we can't, even if we can't define what it might look like, are there principles, are there ways of thinking about this that could be a guide for these, um, for these professionals, these practitioners? Yeah, so that's a new word I learned today, endogenous. You know? <laughs> I had to look it up, but I learned a lot. And uh, endogenous means internal, it means domestic, it means gut. Endogenous means home. I was shocked. I'm like, one word? Endogenous <laughs> means intimate, it means private, in-house, inland inside interior visceral and inner you know so i talked about identity and i'm thinking it will all start when we have a conversation with ourselves you know i've always felt like we're lost in space and time as as a people i think if you think about nairobi it's just 123 years old right mm -hmm. uh if we're looking at other global cities they've been here much longer um but then people like Aseka tell us that, hey, listen, we had cities too, even prior to, to the colonialists coming. So why aren't we reflecting on those kind of uh, dynamics and activities and then bringing them to the fore post-colonially, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to have some conversations about this, this definitions of home, who are we, mm -hmm. right? And forefront them 
as practitioners. And we always tell our students in the class, hey, like, speak from what you know. Where are you local? Like, that authenticity is what we're looking for because no one else has that kind of experience that you're bringing through your work. That's what we want to see and hear. So that's the attention that needs to be given to, to this kind of work of, of documenting heritage or, or placing our mark in the now in the 21st century. There needs to be, first of all, a cognizance of who we are, right? And then you speak from there. So if, if I was to be allowed to imagine a bit, I'd love for a moment for us as the global South to be in a bubble, just away from the West and all its pressures, right? So we can just now say like, ah, <laughs> breathe, first of all, because stuff has happened so quickly. Mara were being asked, you know, participate in the global benchmark. And benchmark, we don't even know where we're coming from, first of all, so that we can begin to speak from that knowledge, right? So we, we need to get into the space of producing our own knowledge, then outputting that into our various expressions. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and then that's why I talk of that imaginary of being in a, in, in a bubble so that we can have just, just see what we're able to come up with without the interference, right? So to foreground, to center ourselves, to take time to be, to, 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 to be domestic, so we can have those unique expressions coming out. That's, that's my imagination for, for, for addressing that. So the, the principles, I always tell my students, follow the brief, follow the brief. Listen, you want to speak from where, what you know, not what you think, you know, uh, others, you'd hope others would, right? So, so coming from that genuine place, uh, from your society, from your group, um, without interference, that would be a good place to start. So, so those are the principles to create value, to create appeal, think of longevity, think of the legacy, think of the people you're leaving all of this work for, I think, crucial. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still harping on that before we get to the principles is, is you know, what is the brief? Mm -hmm. And the brief is to foreground ourselves and our identity and our heritage. If we could just even across uh, disciplines have conversations, that would be invaluable so that we could uh, talk to each other, things like placemaking network. I love what BookBunk is doing in Eastlands and rejuvenating, um, I know that the colonial buildings, the, the libraries and so on and so forth, but when you think of the Kaloleni social hall and all the activities that um, took place there, the dancing, the, the unionizing that led to our freedom. So these stories need to be, to be brought up again. We need to sit by a fire, we need to talk, we need to breathe. We need to understand who we are and, and generate. So we might have to throw away even those books, those, those um, principles, those 11 principles that come with place. Where did those come from? You know, we need to interrogate their origin and then say, you know, but, but what, what do we think about how to make our spaces beautiful with, with expressions of art or with buildings? What does our architecture look like? So, Joy, if you could give us a, a, a kagap, a place to sit and have these conversations, <laughs> they're necessary to have those. So throw it Thank you, thank you so much, Flo. Thank you very much. And I think that you, um, you've said that there are conversations we must have. Um, and then there's certain things that we, we really need to, to, to foreground and center and balance for ourselves, that in a sense, um, the, the, the passage of time has swept us off our feet and we, we hardly have time to find ourselves before we're getting into other ideas, sustainable urban development, this and that and so on. And, and of course, we're part of the world, so we cannot not be impacted by some of these ideas and these movements and these concerns. But which brings me, I think, segues very well to um, our fourth and final panelist, George Arabu who is a practicing architect, as I mentioned. He's, he's um, a chairman of a chapter of the Architectural Association of Kenya, but he's also a director in his own right of a firm that he leads of Sitescape Studio Limited. And I think George, as you were listening to the, um, the panelists that have come before you, um, I, I, I'm sure that you take away as I do, uh, a, a great complexity 
when we begin to discuss this question of, of, of city and the urban space and the opportunities for culture to begin to create spaces that work for us for today. Um, but at the same time, I think as an architect, um, you also know um, that beyond the question of the social question of identities and heritage and so on, that there's the, the infrastructure, there's poor planning, there's um, sometimes a want of regulation, um, there's uncontrolled development and so on. And these also are beginning to define the way that, that our cities and our neighborhoods um, look. But I think that as, as Flo was indicating, there are many new things that are coming on board that sometimes we are almost breathless to, you know, to, to sort of take advantage of or even consider. And one of them I know, and we've been in these discussions with you, is the notion of sustainable urban development. And within that idea of sustainable urban development, of course, are several components. Some of them are to do with the materiality of the things that we build. What are we using in terms of sustainable materials? But some of them are to do with the process. Are they participatory? Are we having conversations, as Flo says, with across discipline areas, with community and so on? Um, so I guess my, my, my first question to you will be, and I said it picks up well from Flo, who's a teacher. Um, when you now reflect on your own education as, as an architect, um, and you're thinking about the challenges and the opportunities for, for, for creating better urban spaces today, what might a more rounded um, education be for urban professionals that can help them cope with, with these challenges, but also take advantage of the opportunities where you have fantastic creatives like a Maggie and a Babouchet, um, who are great at advocating things, at collaborating in terms of policy, but also making um, public art and shaping our cities that way. What do you think the education of an architect should probably look like today? All right, uh, thank you, uh, Joy, and uh, thanks for the other speakers. I think they've set a, a very good tone and I, I want to, uh, let, let me carry uh, through that, but let me, allow me to first say that uh, it, this this whole idea about the free cities and Kisumu hosting is, and the focus on the uh, on intermediary cities, it, it's quite apt uh, because uh, in, my, in my mind, uh, this ties very well with the issue of devolution, with the new, the promulgation of the new constitution, where we are now looking at, looking outside the capital. Um, because when you talk about opportunities, this is a situation where, unfortunately, we are sitting in this opportunity. And as the other guys have talked about, the presenters before me, that out there, people are seeing opportunities in Africa. We we haven't seen these opportunities. You know, look at the these uh, intermediate cities as open season for planners, open season for architects, artists. This is like a, a tabula rasa in terms of uh, uh, planning. And I can say that one of the things that I really wish we learned in school, and I'm just talking from the, uh, from the extent of when I was in school and what I'm seeing out here, would have been the idea that, can I learn in Nairobi and practice outside Nairobi? Can I go outside to a small town that is just growing and has opportunities and I can have an impact in it as an, as, as, as an architect, for example. And of course, we are now looking at practitioners, you know, we are talking about urban designers right now, um, Technical University offers that program for urban design. It's probably the only institution that does that. And it's still a fight where do they belong because they're not regu regulated. There's no uh, legal framework for theirs. But we know this is a practice that is very important. We are looking at a situation where I look at myself as an architect. And you know, architecture is the art and science of building. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because of the rat race we have as architects, we are big, we have been bought, let me put it that way, uh, <laughs> by private developers. We are chasing money, the person who can build flats and all that. We've completely forgotten our other home uh, with Akinabaki, which is the art. And um, I, I really feel that if this is brought out in schools, because the, uh, one of the biggest uh, lessons that I, I learned later was that we, as much as you learn all that, you need to go through the rigor of the curriculum. But one of the things you must learn is that the solutions in Africa, we are leaving the problems. They are not future problems. Okay, the first world, 
plan on problems for future. They foresee there will be a lot of traffic here, there will be a lot of people here. They plan based on the future. In Africa, we are actually planning based on the current situation. When we are talking about the pressures on, on urban spaces, the pressures on utilities, the pressures on how much private developers are way ahead of the local authorities providing services. You always find new towns coming up, they don't have sewer lines. You find new neighborhoods, they don't have services. So the, 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 the authorities are always playing catch up. And this is the realities that we are facing right now, that our students need to learn. That the moment they get out of school, they are not coming out to rehearse how to solve problems. They're coming out into problems. They're already living in problems, just that they don't know how to approach them yet. And I wish we could really focus on that. But how do they do that? There is a need for that connection between education and practice, which is lacking. And, 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 and Florence will know this. I, I, I did some part time, and I think there's another Florence here who's also a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. And they know this that there's a very, very weak link between the practice, that is the reality, and education. There's no synergy where a student can toggle between class and mm -hmm. real life situation. So that when they eventually do these uh, so called projects and thesis, they are way in a big way based on theory rather than on, on, on practice. And I, I, I've, I've spoken this before with a, a couple of students. Um, we were discussing, um, um, you know, with the technical advice, I was there last week, um, because it's like this, uh, the, this, the schools, sorry, the students are waiting for their lives to begin. Unfortunately, there's no time for that. By the time your life begins, you are old. As practitioners practitioner in the industry, we get our major project when you are old, but you must be ready by having experience from the time you set foot in the school of design, school of planning, school of engineering. So let me stop for now. No, jo? thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, George. And I think you've said some, some very important things there. Um, and, and I'll just pick up on, on, on one of them, on two of them. One is that you've indicated, you know, studying in Nairobi or studying whether it's in Kisumu at a university there or Mombasa, but being able to have the opportunity to practice in another town, that that is actually not a thinking that we, we, we try to in a place where the West, the developers give us sweat. Um, then the other thing, of course, um, there's a disconnect between the, 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 the teaching and, of course, being thrown in the deep end. But here, it's not a rehearsal. You're not imagining what might, what might be in the urban space. You're actually plunged into an urban space that has so much challenges, and you need to begin to think about how do you engage that? How do you resolve that as an architect or a planner, as a professional in the built environment? One of the things that we certainly have done, and I know you're aware of this as the go down, is to, is to come in from the other side and to look at these urban questions by working with community, to sort of say that the answer cannot just sit with us. Yeah, the answer sits in those who are also experiencing these challenges. Can you just sort of reflect or make a comment on how do you think um, urban professionals, urban design professionals can begin to think about practices that work with community? Do they, do, uh, do, does it stretch out the time for working and therefore are inconvenient. Um, how can it be mainstreamed in the practice so that it is, it is just part of the way that we work, that there are actually solutions within those who are experiencing the challenges and how do we draw that value from them and use that in design? Do you think that this is something that could happen? Yeah, um, indeed. I, 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 in fact, uh, yeah. Uh, that's what solves problems um, you know, that we are facing, which are challenges. And uh, art or design uh, helps us live with our problems. You know, when, when, when uh, Mike is doing uh, sculptures and we, we, we sort of create this space, this space where people come and uh, they're able to experience uh, urban spaces and just, you know, just enjoy them and, and take them in. It, it's, a, it's, it's that art that actually helps uh, the challenges that we are going through, because the reality is that we are going through challenges. What I know is that it is very possible for us to uh, work collaboratively, but the reality is that we are not. Uh, even in schools of design, um, the, the, the departments are actually set such that 
uh, there together. Like you'll find the Department of Special Planning and Architecture, Urban Design, they're all together. Uh, um, you know, interior design, engineer, they're mostly then the same colleges. But when they are actually implementing projects or even doing discussions, they never work together. Uh, so it starts off from our education. Everyone designs in a silo. There is no final year thesis where you are told to do as a group. Okay, you are not asked to design with a QS. You only discover these people when you come to the industry out here. Now, secondly, community projects and all these urban planning projects, they have got a very important elements of the community and working in collaboration. Why? Because urban spaces have a common public interest. And as practitioners, we are ideally the advocates of the common good. You know, the fact that private projects have overtaken us, they, they have overtaken the importance of common good is unfortunate, especially in Africa. Uh, why? Because we have a challenge of people making a decision between doing a small residential house for someone and extending beyond the setbacks and doing windows open to the neighbor and roofs. And then because they're going to be paid, and there's a very little emphasis on common good projects like working on streets, for example, or doing uh, public schools or doing public spaces. These are not projects that are given emphasis on. So we have never been thrown in a situation where we must work with a, a visual artist, for example. We've not been thrown into a situation whereby we must work with a cultural artist to develop a space that is for the public good. The, the, the good part of the good thing I can say is that this is possible. How is it possible? Well, um, there has to be something. Of course, either the government allocates funds for this kind of project and intentionally plans for them, which is not happening very soon because one, we have constraints in terms of budgets, and then two, we have our policy making based on political decisions where budgets are allocated before projects are planned. So that when you go to a county, you will be told we have already allocated money for this project and it must happen. And if it doesn't happen, the money goes back to the treasury. Uh, unfortunately, if, if we look at it that way, the other part is also the consultants who have, um, uh, or professionals who have, of course, relegated their job to working with the person who pays the, them. So um, if we look at it from the aspects of, for example, what the go down is doing, and I know wh what, why this is possible because there are a lot of, uh, of, uh, of people who are in this space of collaborative work. Um, I, I, I can see Constant Cup here. Um, who is guiding a, a particular discourse in terms of just general urban plan, it is possible for us to come together and start challenging. And in fact, what I'm looking at is an issue of dreams because we will have to start with dreaming. I like what Babushe is, 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 is that they're doing in Akuru. I mean, I was there before, just before the, the city status was given and we had a very good session with as AK with the, with the, with the, with the, the entire ministry and, and a lot of the government officials. And they were telling us how the plans are going with the, with the city plan. And we were, we're looking at a decision by we hope that we start looking at how do we engage everyone on board, planners, engineers, architects, and we come and say we want to do a street festival. It doesn't have to be something that is about demolishing building or building new ones, but it's about dreaming on how our intermediary cities could be. Remember, right now, let me just completely say that Nairobi is our big problem. And Nairobi can be looked at as that firstborn child who's spoiled and given everything. And the parents forget about the other middle children because the first child always gets the best things. So intermediary cities need to start intentionally targeting groups of people, professionals, artists, bringing them together and let them dream, even if the funds are not there. Always having a blueprint is the best way to work around it and say that in the future, this is what we want our city to be like. And once we get to that point where we think that everyone's input is important then the community comes in and owns the design so it's not going to be some guy came from nairobi with a plan and is imposing on us though it is something we came up with once um, a few years ago i was involved with a, a group called safer nairobi initiative and we went to do spaces in korogosho it was actually called Ndotoya korogosho we had a very interesting uh, public gathering where the community was there kids and adults professionals designers and we were just thinking what are the dreams that people want? Sometimes just speaking to someone and asking them, what do you want? For the professionals, we will try to now, how do you ID, how, how do you detail that? Because if a kid tells you, I want a place I can ride a bike between my house and the school, and, that, and now you as a professional, your job will be thinking, how do we do that? How do we do, we do the traffic separation? So 
Um, that was a very interesting one. It never happened. Why? Uh, because of the various challenges. And those challenges are expected. But that dream is on paper. If today someone came up with facilitation or the government decided uh, Korogosho is a special planning area, someone will pull out that problem, a dream, and can be able to be implemented. So the idea of collaboration is no doubt the most important thing. And I want hopefully pray that uh, the, my, my other panelists who have been, especially the artists, Maggie, uh, Babushe, and I mean, even Florence, of course, since you are in the School of Design there, we need to look at from the point of how do we alleviate people's problems? Because solving the design solutions are actually solutions. They are not, it's not engineering. It's a very simple solution of why, how can we make an old lady cross the road in Akuru and not be hit by a car? So mm. it's like that, that simple. And then we say, how then do we do it? We plan around uh, prototyping. I think I like the idea of the street uh, festivals because they disrupt what is happening, even if it's just for a day. But then we would have uh, sown a seed, but then the community can pick up and say, we want that done again. Joy. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. And thank you for giving us you know, a, a, a real picture of some of the practical challenges of, of practice. But I think that um, when I consider all of your interventions, um, it seems to me that the last question which I was going to ask you, but which I think you know, has been responded to in a sense through the interventions, is that a local architectural practice or urban design practice really should be one that is extending itself and looking at collaborations. And even if you cannot absorb some of these professionals directly within your office, so in other words, within your office, it's not, it's not that you actually also have a, a visual artist or a sculptor on board. It's not that you actually have the, the, the academic or the researcher right there beside you. It's not that you actually have the sociologist in office, but you have access to them and you have a considered practice that thinks about how do you bring them on board with everything that you're trying to do to make sure that, that things are looked at holistically and therefore that the solutions are actually truly responsive um, to the moment and to the, and to the challenge. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for those, for those interventions. Um, and I think that you've also re-emphasized the whole purpose of why we were doing this pre-event, which is to focalize the idea of intermediary cities and it seems to me then that in a sense, what we're all saying is that when we look at Africa, most of these, most of these other urban spaces are intermediary spaces. And because we have not yet, um, uh, what's the word, spoiled them or ruined them by, by overdeveloping as Nairobi is happening, uncontrolled development or whatever it is that is happening in capital cities, that there's a real opportunity to dream about changing the urban landscape of Africa quite significantly, of Kenya quite significantly, in very interesting and special ways, where we are working collaboratively, where we are bringing in the public artists, where we are recognizing that the role of culture in the design and the development of these spaces is just as crucial as the role of the professional whose, whose, whose um, practice is, is urban design or architectural design. So thank you, thank you all so much for these interventions. But now I think that we'll open it up to the floor for maybe a few questions, and then and then we will um, come to the close by asking um, uh, my colleague Bogwa to just share a little bit around where the Godan is heading with these um, this idea of the urban and these urban conversations that some of you have been participating in with us. So, are there any questions from the floor? We're just trying to see whether there are any. Constant. Constant. Um, yeah, I, I can't quite see, but constant. I think yes. Please, you have a comment. Is it is it in the chat or? No. Okay, you've got your hand up. Yeah, constant. Please. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm sorry, guys, I joined uh, a bit late, but uh, very nice uh, conversations here. Just one comment about these intermediary, intermediary cities. And, and, and one of the fears, I would say, I have uh, about them is the direction they may take in the way, is, is them taking the direction that the bigger cities and capitals have taken. And uh, Good to see uh, Babusha is from Nakuru because that's one city I fear for. <laughs> um, already there is talk of uh, a highway going over the city by you know, Kenya National Highways Authority. There is talk of uh, you know there is, there is talk of the, the, the kind of you know, removal of public transport out of the city. You know that kind of inclination that we've had over the years. The, what uh, George is talking about the non-inclusive. Uh, Approach towards planning where people are not particularly involved. Unfortunately, I'll talk a bit about another engagement that uh, is going on in 
to be in the same city. Constant, your, your, your sound is just disappearing. Yep. Okay. Uh, there you go, back on, yep. Yeah. Within, within the same city, there's also a group trying to work on uh, what we call the pillars of social, pillars of social justice in, in, develop, in developing uh, urban spaces, which bring in aspects such as... Uh, ah, okay, the yeah. sound's gone. Yeah, keep yeah, keep going. Yeah, you're saying the pillars of social justice. Yeah. The sound which is just going a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, which brings in aspects such as inclusivity, such mm. as uh, participation. That's you That's know good. that kind of that kind of approach in order to you know ensure that uh, create that understanding and, mm. and and have everybody involved in the planning and development of 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 the urban area. Otherwise, we just end up in a cycle. You know. Second point, sorry to talk a bit. There's also the other challenge of the development agencies that come, you know, from other countries. Uh, you know, a big uh, money coming from China, from Japan. No time for inclusivity. They throw in projects, and then we end up, you know, within the same mess that we have. So we have to be very careful with our free cities because then you see the people will be thrown aside first by the way the artists, even before the planners and the architects. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know they'll they'll just you know we've seen through the expressway um and, and such. So let's you know we're taking into into account those we we can think about how to approach you know all our smaller and upcoming cities from that perspective. Mm. No thank you thank you Constant. So in a sense you're saying that even though the intermediary cities do present an opportunity, there's a lot of lessons to learn around things not to do. Yeah, so what things should we not carry over into, into that? And yes, and, and I think you very clearly stated some of the highways that are being built, but also um, some of our bilateral partners and others who do these developments for us. And, and, and it's exactly that, they do the developments for us. We're not involved, we're not engaged. And yes, and then we have spaces that are not necessarily reflective of what is best for us. I think there's some other comments in there. Was there a comment? Yeah. Deborah. Deborah. Um, from George, she wrote it on the chat. Oh, you've written it on the chat. Um, I think that those ones we can know if we open our chats, we can probably see those chats. Yes, question to it's, George. So it's a question to George. I'm just trying to open the chat and see what that question is so I can. Deborah, are you able to speak? And oh, George, can you see the question? Um, yeah, I'm reading it, but so. if, if she can speak, please, uh, Deborah, just go ahead. I think it's good to hear your voice, but I can read it. I, I was just going to read it in the chat. Yeah, please Deborah. go ahead. All right, thanks. I My connection is a bit unstable. I'll, I hope you'll hear me through. Yes, um, yes. So my, my, my point was on what you raised concerning the different um, departments within the School of Architecture. I'm not, I'm not an architect. Um, but my thinking is if, yes, there's a place for possibly um, some collaboration within um, the edu, like where people are in school, maybe one project during the long holidays. But if we say that now it, you need to start um, including things like working with artists and all that, wouldn't then the curriculum end up being too bloated and length, that, that period of learning being um, extended so much that um, the principles of uh, whatever that school is teaching end up either being diluted or lost. And then people end up not learning those technical principles they learn, they need to learn for the sake of the workforce. Um, one of the things I learned when I was, my pupil master used to tell me all the time is that law school will only teach me five to 20% of what I need, life will teach me 20%, 80%. And so that's the, the concept that I have. Um, school is meant to teach us everything. It's just meant to guide us in a particular direction. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. George, you will respond to that? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, let, me, let me try to respond it as quickly as possible. Um, Deborah, I, I I totally agree. That, that, I mean, you learn only twenty percent of, uh, of of the, what what life throws at you. Uh, but uh, my point was on the issue of collaboration, uh, which doesn't have to be part of the curriculum in terms of the entire learning session, but rather when you are doing a project, for example, it could be a final year project or one or two, a couple of projects. You know, at the beginning, most uh, uh, beginners or the, the 
first years in the colleges, they always have common courses because they, they, the curriculum anticipates that you will need to do communication skills, all of you. You will need to study, you know, mathematics together. Um, what they, they do is that later on, as you become a senior student, when I think you need more of the collaboration, they, for, they don't uh, have any uh, joint uh, group things. And sometimes if, like, you know, the quantity surveyors and architects and planners, they learn within one building. And there would be nothing wrong if uh, the architect did a project and was told that they needed to work with a quantity surveyor. Same project, quantity surveyor would focus on a bit or his bit, and the architect would focus on a bit or his bit. Um, the other thing is that you need to consider also the fact that uh, everything that we do in this space, when it comes to public good projects or projects which require planning, they are not single discipline. In fact, the reason why an architect, for example, I'm not speaking for everyone, plans geology and they learn uh, social, the so psychology, uh, so sociology, um, we, we learn economics, uh, we learn a lot to do with other aspects, but they are done as a token right at the beginning. And towards the end, you're then uh, thrown into this, uh, you know, silo or black box, and you always find people doing their own project in a small cocoon. But immediately you graduate, the first project you do, you have to do it with other people. So that's what I'm saying, that we need to start this uh, idea of collaborative working, and then at the same time, just linking, because I think, for example, what Maggie is doing in the railway stations, it, it is tied to what, if, if the railway station design was done from the beginning, the moment when Constant was planning that railway station, they thought about where artwork is going. And by the time they actually come into through the buildings, they already know where the artwork is going. It will just be a seamless uh, flow. The challenge you have in this country, unfortunately, I can say this, that politicians make most of the decisions at a whim. Okay, they will say that we want this done. But then if you look at the process, the process, the best way to have projects accepted by public and for the public good and sustainable is to have a situation whereby someone, everyone has a say, and the most important uh, principles or partners have an input. The reason why, for example, the expressway and a couple of other projects have issues is that as artists, we don't fill our space there. As uh, designers, you know, the soft landscape people, as architects and landscape uh, the, uh, the architects, we feel like it's too hard. It could have been made a little bit softer just so that it marries in with the, the other issues. So that's, I think that's what I was trying to bring across, Deborah, and I hope maybe I've clarified that. Thank you. Thank you. So Diane, I think we'll take the last one from Diane. Diane, you had your hand up. Well, oh. you <laughs> yeah, thank you um, for the opportunity. Sorry. So I was just actually say, chatting uh, MK and nah. he pointed out that we don't have too much time. Uh, so I'll just try and make it quick. I think I appreciate so much the this kind of platform where we get to uh, leave practice and kind of reflect on how we operate. Uh, I'm an architect by training. Uh, and I think the one thing that has really stood out to me in this conversation is the question of identity and how we approach it. And I think there are two emerging things. Um, the issue of a historical reclamation, which is like the decolonization. And um, I, I struggle a bit with that word because it, colonization is something that happened. Uh, it's our reality. And there's nothing wrong with that being part of our history. I think if we have an honest interrogation of what happened, because it is a brutal thing, and even how we talk about it and, or how we react to it is, um, how people react to trauma. We don't really look at the reality of what it is. Um, we kind of whitewash it, literally. We take the lens of the colonialist when we discuss it. It seems this thing, like this thing where we imagine all this prim and proper British um, culture and not the real violence and brutality that was carried out. So I think that's something that um, if we have the courage to interrogate would be quite transformative. And then, you know, there's also um, the re reality that culture is emergent and it's exists, it exists right now. So we, what is happening right now, even the things that we are not always comfortable about, um, the, like what we're talking about, our city not working, uh, it's emerging from the needs. Um, it's informed by the needs. So um, design, whether good or bad, is a response to a need. Um, and maybe a more useful way of looking at it is interrogating what the need that this thing is serving uh, and then kind of improving and then having iterations. So we get better and better um, over time. 
Uh, so maybe not to completely do away with everything, but also to kind of improve what is happening. So um, yeah, I could go on forever, but yeah, I think I'll just leave it there. No, thank you, Dan. I think one of the interesting things that you say there is is that um, is that this, so, so perfection, if I can put words in your mouth, is a process, and that sometimes you will design or something will be designed in in response to a need, and it might not be the best thing, but perhaps we should have take the long view and keep improving on things that, that have been done out of expediency and continue to improve them. Which means that as I think as professionals, that we take cognizance of things that have been done before us and to not just um, start things new because we can, but also try and see how we build on and improve on things that have happened um, you know, prior. So yeah, I think that's, and, and, and of course the, the discussion around identity is, is, is a huge one and an ongoing one and really fundamental to this question of creating spaces um, that, that, that work for, for, for people uh, and wherever they are. Okay, so I think that I'd like to thank the, the I think that this has been um, very, very informative. And I think the links between your different engagements are clear that while we sit in particular spaces in terms of the work that we do, they're clear and these clear need are spaces that will encourage those of us who are professionals in this space to do that more and more. Um, to close, I think I will ask my colleague Mbogwa to, to, um, to basically introduce um, the idea of the Go Down Urban. Uh, for those of you who know the Go Down, we've been doing quite a bit of work in the urban space, and we're beginning to try to see how we, we can consolidate um, uh, what this aspect of work of the Go Down is. We don't know, we are discovering it. But Mbogwa will, um, will just give an indication of some of the things that, that we are seeing and thinking and some of the activities that actually we'll engage in in the summit um, next week. Thank you, Mbogwa. Um, Shall I turn the sound down or you're okay? Turn, turn. turn my sound down, so use yours. Yeah. yeah, sorry, we are in the same room. So I'm just gonna turn my sound down so that Mbogwa can- Mute yourself. Yeah, I'll mute myself as well. Mbogwa, you're muted. You're muted. No, okay. Uh, let me try again. Yeah, 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 okay. Okay, apologies for those technical challenges. But yes, thank you very much, Joy. Um, I think it's my job to kind of close uh, these um, this this discussion and just very quickly thank you very much everyone uh, particularly our panelists for for joining us um, uh, from from Nakuru we've had Babushe who is a, a thespian and, and and in arts management who are, who has been advocating for for Nakuru to join the the UNESCO Creative Cities Network which it did last year and um, I think he has he has we we are eagerly looking forward to learning about what Nakuru is proposing and to helping them um, achieve um, their plans. Um, uh, uh, in the public art, um, thank you very much, Maggie. I think we, we've learned about the two types of, of um, work that Maggie has done in the public art installations, um, how to bring out the heritage of a place and how um, as meeting places, they, there can be engagement brought out by public art installations. Um, and from Flo Flora, who is a lecturer at the Technical University. Um, the process, I think we've, we've learned that the process of all cities is dynamic. And uh, even though things are fast moving um, and breathless, and we are trying to catch up with, with so-called other people, that, that we should take time to breathe and, 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 and reflect on our histories and, and where we are and, 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 and apply those. And, and also from George is, is how to, as Joy put it, look over the fence, reach out to all the different people um, um, who can help build a holistic um, urban realm and, and, uh, and, and a holistic world for all of us. So in terms of uh, the Go Down's urban division, very quickly, as Joy said, the Go Down, which is about to turn 20 years, has for about 10 years now really done a lot of work in the urban realm. Um, some of that work includes um, participating in, in, 
in terms of Nairobi's um, um, planning through the new plan, the Godan was invited uh, in the new plan. It has it was also invited to the public space committee for the Nairobi City County government. This was in the early 2010s. And a lot of this work has come out of the Go Downs Transformation Project, which is a, a spiritual, physical, and programmatic second phase of growth of the institution. And uh, this transformation project includes a number of initiatives and three that directly relate to the built environment are the property redevelopment. The Go Down has a property in industrial area and uh, it moved out just before COVID intending to start construction and, and and build a modern facility rather than a renovated warehouse that was there. And uh, of course, we, we were affected by COVID, um, but we are hoping to break ground later this year. Um, the Nine Who Festival as well, which um, um, was about going to neighborhoods and asking them, what is it, what is it about your neighborhood that um, is, is interesting or is valuable to you? Um, and then of course, more recently, the Her City Her Streets initi initiative, which is a partnership with UN Habitat to design the streets around this upcoming building. That again, we, are, we, are, we shouldn't think about silos, about our property boundary, that we also should think about the public spaces outside the boundary, how we are relating to neighbors, how we are relating to the vendors, how we are relating to um, um, the mobility or the transport needs of, of, of the people around us. Um, so those are the three primary projects that the Godown is, is working on at the moment, but it also has other activities um, and, and what we are calling programming activities. So one of them is this session, the, the Urban Dialogue series. Um, this is the third one. We had two last year and we're hoping to have six this year. Uh, one of them will be doing Placemaking Week Nairobi, which is an annual week-long event. And uh, we are currently planning for that with, with the Placemaking Network. And of course, Urban October, which is a, a whole month of October where we highlight urban issues. And then of course, we are, we are part of different networks, uh, placemaking Nairobi, as I mentioned, and the, the global public space network at UN Habitat. And other research and practice and, and policy work that uh, advocacy work that we've been doing together with the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town, um, the Barnard College, the architecture department of a Barnard College in Colum Columbia University, and more locally, um, Woodlife Sweden exhibition um, um, in conjunction with the Swedish Embassy in Kenya, where the Godown has been a panelist and is co-hosting some activities. And then now in, 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 in our intermediary city of Kisumu, which is now the star uh, for the next uh, week or so, um, the Godown was, was invited last year to join the Kisumu City County Government Economic and Social Council. And in fact, just before Africa cities, there, there'll be a meeting held um, on Monday. And I think, um, um, yeah, as Joyce said, we are trying to formalize so that we can be more effective in, in our work and we welcome everybody to join us in our journey. Karibuni sana. And now about Africa cities next week, um, I, I think the go down has been, uh, or is planning for five events. The first one was today, which is, which is a pre-event. And as I mentioned, there's, the, the, uh, there's a round table meeting next week actually, um, which the governor is hosting and has invited the Kisumu Economic and Social Council to be present with investors and talk about uh, what Kisumu has to offer and, and how we can uh, go about developing Kisumu. Um, there will be a panel discussion on the 17th of May, um, which will be in the main summit. And this is uh, with the African Center for Cities. There will be an exhibition, which is uh, the Godown Art Center and the Embassy of Sweden co-hosting an exhibition, which will run from the 17th uh, to the 19th of May. Um, it will be in the Grace Onyango Social Center, which is outside the main um, 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 summit uh, activities. And on the 18th of May in the afternoon, there will be a panel discussion um, uh, also at the same place at the Grace Onyango Social Center, co-hosted by the Godown and the Embassy of Sweden. And the discussion will be about planning for sustainable urban development and urban living. So for those who will be in Kisumu, karibuni sana. Um, for those who, who won't be there, we will try and figure out how we, we will live stream or, or, or uh, join in the conversations, or at least follow up after the summit, what, what came out of it and how can we engage. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Um, and uh, we are very encouraged that, that there is a community that is eager to have these reflections. 
and, and explore how we can have sustainable urban development and how we can, can create an, an urban African identity. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to the next urban dialogue. We will uh, try and inform uh, uh, everybody a bit earlier so that they can plan. But thank you very much for taking the time. Asante. Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, we, can, we, can, we can leave there. I will, I will stop recording uh, shortly. Um, but I think what I'll do, uh, I'll, I'll change the view so that maybe everyone can turn on their cameras and I can screenshot and you can see who is in the room and uh, uh, people can do a thumbs up or something interesting. Uh, so Karibuni, everyone, you can turn off your turn on your camera, and and we see everybody. Um, okay, so I'll take the screenshot in uh, five seconds. So count down: <laughs> five, four, three, two, one. Uh, I think you need to give people more time. Uh, <laughs> uh, people, Let everyone come on. Oh, um, the ones. <laughs> uh, so we are waiting for who? Deborah, Florence, Diane. You know, maybe people were were, were not were not ready. <laughs> yeah. Just I'm, call them out. Cam they will, cameras. They will turn it on. <laughs> cameras have refused. But I think this is a good. We have a good critical mass. So Asante Nisana, um, I have taken a number of screenshots. Uh, yeah, look for our social media followers. We will try and report and post about the discussions we've had today. And uh, thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I, I will leave the chat on for a minute or two. You can say your goodbyes and, 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 and leave at your own pleasure. Thank you very much.